Welcome to this first lecture on group equivariant deep learning. Uh, my name is Erik Beckes. I'm a assistant professor in the Amsterdam Machine Learning Lab of the University of Amsterdam. And this module that uh, I'm providing with these videos is actually part of a uh, module within the Deep Learning 2 course currently provided in uh, our master AI program of the University of Amsterdam. And so this module is about group equivariant deep learning and it's split into four lectures. And with this video, we kick off the first lecture by providing an introduction to a regular group convolutions. Um, before I get there, I want to sketch the outline of this lecture. So it's split in seven videos or parts. Um, I start off with an, uh, a motivation uh, coming from desirable properties of neural networks, such as invariance, equivariance, and weight sharing. And then I want to go to the core of this lecture, which is about regular group convolutions. So I'm going to provide an, provide an explanation of regular group convolutions. Before we get there, and actually throughout this uh, lecture series, uh, I have to provide or introduce some group theoretical preliminaries uh, in order to formalize and also understand uh, what's actually going on uh, behind uh, the scenes. Okay, so introduction, group theory, and then uh, regular group convolutions. And then in lecture 1.4, we go over an example where we build a group equivalent neural network um, to uh, solve a problem in histopathology, namely the classification of uh, well, cancer uh, tissue. And then I uh, would like to place this lecture in context because there's been quite some work on group equivariant deep learning. So how to construct such uh, equivariant neural networks for what kind of groups uh, can we do this? So I want to provide a brief history of group convolutional neural networks. Uh, and then I would like to move on to the, the final part of this lecture and that is going over the statement, uh, group convolutions are all you need. And this is obviously like, like a, a fancy statement, um, but the, it has some very strong theoretical underpinning to it. Actually, what I want to cover in this part is showing that if you want to build a neural network, which is equivariant, then the linear layers must be uh, group convolutions. And this is really nice. This is a motivation that indeed, if you want equivariance, then group convolutions are like the only tool basically that, that you need. Um, and in order to show this uh, statement, which we have formalized in a theorem, we need uh, a little bit of extra theory, which is also going to help us understand um, different types of neural networks, uh, equivalent neural networks uh, in the long run. Okay, so let's move on to the motivation. Um, in many applications, we want to build neural networks that have some geometric guarantees, and uh, most notably that of invariance. Uh, consider this example in histopathology where we want to, for example, classify such a cell as being either healthy or pathological. Then we can train a neural network to do this for us, right? So we provide it to the system and it says it's a healthy cell. Um, but obviously we're looking at an invariant problem here, right? So the, the, the pose or the orientation on which I image uh, this cell is completely arbitrary. So if I rotate it, it's still the same cell. And so you would also hope then that the neural network still say, uh, says it's a, a healthy cell. Uh, but we don't have this guarantee actually. It might even say the exact opposite. And then in many applications, this is completely problematic. So a solution to this is to rely on data augmentation. So what you do is you train the neural network to be invariant. So you create all these copies, rotated samples, and you keep the training label the same. So, uh, well, you, you learn, train the neural network to be invariant. The label stays the same, it stays invariant, but you create all these rotated uh, copies. Now, this solves the problem to a large extent, but doesn't completely solve it. Still, we do not have guarantees of invariance. And actually, we're showing this in one of the uh, subsequent videos, that even if you train a neural network in such a, in such a way, uh, we might still occasionally have that if I rotate it, it, it gives the wrong answer, whereas on other rotation to give the correct answer. But still, it's a very convenient and useful trick. Um, but another motivation to sort of address this issue is that um, we actually now let the neural network learn how to deal with these geometric properties, which, we, which are actually quite well understood. And that is the whole 
purpose of group convolution neural networks to bake these geometric constraints into the neural network such that we have guarantees, uh, but also such that we can be more efficient in our parameters. Because now the neural network needs to learn how to be equivalent, so a lot of capacity is lost on, uh, well, on this. And we actually see that by looking at the, the redundancy in these feature representations. And that brings me to this very nice uh, blog post, um, a distilled blog post called Naturally Occurring Equivalence in Neural Networks uh, by these uh, authors. I definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, so what they show in this post is that, so they visualize uh, neural networks in so all sorts of ways, uh, but you can visualize, for example, the filter bank or the set of kernels uh, learned in the first layers of a neural network. And what you see that these filters represent some features like edges or line detectors. And we see a lot of rotated copies of the same features popping up. So this means actually that the neural network is learning to detect this edge and this edge separately. So under all these rotations, so there's a lot of redundancy. There's one, um, let's say, intrinsic representation, but it also needs to learn all these rotated copies. So we're going to solve this notion of redundancy via group convolutional neural networks where we only need to learn one core representation and let the group symmetries do the rest. Okay, so we talked about invariance as a desirable property, but I actually think equivariance is the most important one. It's all about equivariance. So what does equivariance mean? It means that, uh, well, it is a property of an operator, such as the convolution operator. And this property says that if the input is uh, translated uh, for example, or transformed, the output is transformed in a predictable way. And why is this important? Uh, it's important because if we know that our operator is equivalent, that means we can handle um, structure equally well, regardless of under which pose or transformation, um, well, this particular feature appears in the image. If I am able to detect, let's say, this person over here at this part of the image, I am equally well capable of, uh, well, detecting it. Uh, somewhere else in the image. And so this equivariance property allows for weight sharing and it also allows us to analyze the data locally and build up our receptive field by stacking these convolution layers. And so this whole notion of equivariance which enables weight sharing I think is the whole reason why convolutional neural networks became so effective and popular in computer vision. And now our objective with group convolution neural networks to extend this notion of equivalence beyond just translation. We want to do weight sharing beyond just translations, but also enable it for rotations and scalings, uh, for example. So let's get back to what we know. We know that uh, normal CNNs or convolutions are not equivalent to rotations. Uh, consider, for example, this image, an aerial image of, of a part of a city. And, and let's rotate it. So we have a trained neural network which picks up some features which are relevant for some downstream task. But now if I rotate this aerial plane, the feature maps completely change. I mean, apart from the, the entire rotation of it. So here we have the stabilized view. We see that in that the feature values at a location, for example, here at this building, it completely changes, which makes this feature detector based on normal CNNs completely unreliable in, in many applications. Um, okay, so CNNs are not rotation equivalent, but we can make them rotation equivalent based on, uh, well, the, the theory covered in this lecture, based on group equivalent uh, CNNs. So in this lecture, you, you will learn how to build such neural networks that are equivalent to rotations. And equivalent here means that we have features that have some directional information in them, uh, which means that if I rotate this image and here's a stabilized view, uh, then we can reuse these features for all these poses uh, appearing in the image. And this is nice. So we now have weight sharing not just, beyond, uh, not just at translations or positions in the, the image, but also over rotations. Okay, so equivalence is important because it guarantees that no information is lost when the input it transforms. It just appears somewhere else in the neural network, in the feature maps, so I can still use this information. And this notion of equivalence then also allows uh, for weight sharing. And what we're going to do with group convolutions, we're going to uh, build in this equivalence beyond just translations. And this allows us to provide ge geometric guarantees and, well, this increased weight sharing or maybe view differently uh, being more efficient in our uh, learned uh, representations or in our, in our representation learning.
Now, an important statement that I want to make is that this notion of equivariance and invariance is just is not just important for uh, problems that require invariant uh, solution, but basically for any type of structured data, because equivariance actually preserves the structure of the data. Consider, for example, this computer vision task of, of, of people detection. And this is not an invariant problem because, well, we usually, well, we expect these people to be skating in upright position and we have this fixed horizon and the gravity is pulling everything in, a, in some preferred orientation, uh, let's say. So we are not particularly interested in being able, detecting these skaters if I rotate it with 180 degrees, right? So the problem itself is not invariant. But the features that I learn uh, for those, those appear actually under arbitrary positions, rotations, and scales in the image, right? If I, if I want to uh, de detect a person, I need to detect edges, for example, at vertical uh, orientations, at horizontal orientation, and all these rotations. So core features still appear under all these um, uh, poses. So we want to build equivalents uh, beyond translations to rotations, but also scale. Uh, if I want to detect a person here in the front of the image, I would like to be equally capable here in the back where people appear to be uh, smaller. So we want to have this scale equivalence also baked in the neural networks. And uh, okay, that's what we're going to show in this lecture, how to do this. Okay, so talking about geometric guarantees, um, so equivalence is not just important for increased weight sharing. Some problems actually require or demand uh, this equivalence uh, a property, right? So if you consider, for example, um, this problem of simulating data, an n-body problem where we have all these particles and their velocities and they attract each other. And so now the task would be, for example, to predict the velocity or the positions at the next time step. So that means the task is, given this entire system assigned to every point, a displacement factor or a velocity factor that tells us where am I going to find uh, this particle at the next uh, time point. And obviously these factors should rotate accordingly if this entire system were to be rotated and the factors should rotate accordingly. So the entire neural network should be equivalent uh, to uh, rotations. So on a high level, any task that uh, predicts non-scalar values such as factors or tensors in general uh, requires equivalent architectures. And we also see this, for example, in the domain of computational chemistry, um, where we uh, have to deal with molecules and molecules can be in different states or conformations. And uh, one task would be given a, a certain state of a molecule in some conformational state, uh, what will be its lowest energy state? So how shall I deform this molecule such that it has a natural uh, occurring uh, state? So you could model that by predicting, for example, displacement factors for each atom. And that then again is a, uh, requires equivalent architectures. And I realize this, this image looks a bit uh, funny maybe. Uh, so this actually represents uh, a molecule uh, with, with atoms. And attached to each atom, we actually have these, these colorful blobs. And these colorful blobs are actually representing uh, directional uh, features. And this is something that we're going to explain in lecture two and three. But for now, it's important to know that based on group equivalent deep learning, we can have weight sharing beyond positions in the molecule, but also over orientations of blocks of atoms. And uh, so with this, we can build equivalent architectures. And then in this same application domain, we obviously have to deal with a lot of invariant problems as well, right? So typically uh, a, a property of a molecule is independent of its orientation. Okay. so. Now let's move on to a different type of motivation for group convolutional neural networks. And it has to deal with, uh, it's about dealing with symmetries in data. And this one is motivated from the field of psychology of vision, where we as humans tend to recognize objects by its components or construct higher level objects from its lower level parts. And there's a lot of symmetries going on here. For example, if I have this uh, high level representation of uh, an object, we can say it's built up out of these parts, these cylinder uh, tube-like structures by placing them in, in some relative configuration. And then this bifurcation shows up, um, well, all over the place in this medical image in the different rotations and the different scaling. So the score representation should stay the same. It's just its pose uh, changes. But if its pose changes, then 
these parts, yeah, they the relative con configuration transforms accordingly. Um, okay, so we can talk about objects made of, of smaller parts and these parts itself, of course, they appear all over the place. And these parts could also be made up from uh, of, of lower level parts such as surfaces. Okay, and all of this can be very nicely modeled with, with group theory. For example, these surfaces, they appear all over this medical image. Um, so a surface has a certain position, a certain normal direction, and it can be uh, scaled. So those are all um, transformations that can be modeled by groups. And then by placing these low level components into a relative configuration, we can form these higher level uh, objects, uh, such as tubes. And if this tube rotates or scales, uh, this relative configuration of elements should rotate and scale accordingly. And we can perfectly model this with group theory. And we will uh, occasionally fall back to this recognition by component viewpoint when I'm explaining uh, the group convolutional uh, setting. Now, uh, worth mentioning here is that this recognition by components uh, viewpoint, that's also the rationale behind capsule networks. Where, um, the, the, the idea is to learn representations that represent objects which are made up of lower level uh, parts. Um, yeah, and I think that's a very interesting and related uh, line of research in, in neural networks. And uh, there are actually some interesting papers that quite explicitly connect capsule networks to, uh, to group theory. Okay, and then a final motivation comes from all these symmetries that we encounter in nature. And this was kind of triggered by this, uh, for me at least, uh, by this, this Twitter thread by uh, Chico Camargo, where um, he posed this question like, have you ever noticed how nature seems to love symmetry? And then comes up with this beautiful examples of symmetries occurring in nature and in plants and uh, repeating patterns there and molecules and proteins and, uh, and all sorts of animals. And this is really fascinating. And it makes you wonder why does this happen at all? And that's sort of discussed in this thread. And then the nice thing about Twitter, of course, is that we have all these nice responses to it. And I think this one by Chaitanya Yoshi nicely summarizes it with a quote coming from the paper discussed in, in, in this thread, uh, stating, why does evolution favor symmetric structures when they only represent a minute subset of all possible forms? Um, the answer then is that since symmetric structures need less information to encode, they are much more likely to appear as a potential variation. So symmetry is like a, a major tool in, in nature to be more efficient in representation learning or information processing, because um, I do not necessarily need to know how to manage this entire uh, uh, a plant from, from beginning to end if I am able to locally encode what needs to be done to maintain life in this uh, particular life form. And so I find this thread really inspiring and that, that is precisely the kind of concepts that we want to build into group neural networks to be efficient in learned representations and then reuse these learned representations under different kind of instantiations um, of, well, of, of the features that we're looking at. Okay, so this slide wraps up the motivation. So we start off with uh, that we want uh, often to create architectures that have some guarantees of invariance of our equivariance because our problems demand this, but also because this whole notion of equivariance allowed for weight sharing uh, beyond just translations, but to more general uh, transformation or poses under which features can represent themselves. And then these two examples actually motivate the need or uh, motivate that it is actually kind of natural to uh, incorporate group theory and symmetries into our neural networks as that allows us to be more efficient in uh, the learning of representations.